alongside the, the release of the model codes is uh, an unprecedented level of commitment, ambition, and action that's, that's merging around building codes. Uh, first off is the, the 2021 federal mandate letters, which assigned oversight of building code development and implementation to two federal ministers. Uh, it also made explicit connections between building codes and Canada's climate commitments. And the mandate letters also committed to developing the alterations to existing building codes and uh, as well a net zero emissions code by 2024. We also had a recently released emissions reduction plan where we saw a recognition that adoption and compliance of building codes will also need greater support. Um, so let's start off with adoption of the 2020 model codes. So over the next few slides, I'll walk through the release of the 2020 model codes, highlight some of the benefits of the model codes tiered framework, and also look at how we can build support for their adoption. And we have a, a pretty wide, uh, broad audience. And so I'll just do a, a quick reminder on, on uh, building codes in Canada. So building codes are developed federally and policy direction is given by the, the provinces and territories. Building codes come into force of law when adopted by a province, a territory, or a municipality where allowed. In the past, this has played out differently in each province. Some provinces quickly or automatically adopt the latest codes available. Others develop their own codes. Well, uh, others adopt the national model, or sorry, adapt the national model codes. Well, others adopt a, a building codes at a pace that suits their local market. With the 2020 model codes, we're, on, we're now on a new shared path. So going back to the, the 2017 Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, provinces and territories committed to adopting net zero energy ready codes by 2030. In doing so, no. uh, we, put, we now we put in place a framework to meet that goal over the next eight years. So the 2020 model codes are tiered codes. This means that they use a series of performance tiers to set a clear and predictable path towards 2030, at which point each new building is expected to be uh, so energy efficient that it can supply its own en energy needs with on-site renewable en energy generation or off-site clean energy. And one of the key aspects of the tiered codes is that they provide a roadmap for reaching high levels of, build, of building performance. They help so signal a desired end state. And in doing so, the 2020 codes provide both the time and the direction required to build capacity in the market over the coming years. The tiers represent regulatory certainty, and that certainty is key to helping builders, developers, and manufacturers prepare to meet the market's needs. This helps them invest in their businesses, and in doing so, we'll help uh, introduce innovative ways to deliver safe, affordable, and high-performance buildings. And for the workforce, for carpenters, carpenters, energy advisors, architects, and more, it helps them know that they can invest in themselves to build the, build the knowledge and the skills that pay off in the form of good local jobs. Tiered codes also help utilities and other program providers align incentives with municipal, provincial, and federal climate commitments. And they also help municipalities match the, their, their local ambitions, the ambitions of, of the local government with, with the capacity of the local building sector. And where municipalities have the power to adopt local building codes, the tiered codes also represent greater flexibility for authorities have, having jurisdiction uh, to adopt more stringent tier, tiers early, earlier than their peers. And this, this is the approach that uh, we saw in the BC Energy subcode and, and really helped the BC Energy subcode enjoy broad uptake. Certainty paired with flexibility helps provinces and territories de-risk adoption. De-risk adoption, de de adoption for all players in, in, the, in the building sector. It helps make sure that everyone in the building sector is moving in the same direction and has the supports needed to succeed. How adoption will, will play out in each province and, and territory is still unclear. Uh, many of the provinces and territories are, are undergoing um, review of, of the codes right now. Um, however, Ontario offers an early example of, of how they may uh, interpret adoption. So in Ontario, uh, the province has proposed adoption of a single tier to the exclusion of others. This means that other tiers will not be available or accessible to, to stakeholders across the building sector. Um, in doing so, this undermines the intent and the value of tiered codes, which is to pro provide that long-term and clear regulatory path. So for other provinces, it's important to recognize that to reap the full benefits of the tiered code framework, uh, they must make full, full use, of, uh, use of the full suite of tiers and also make those tiers available for industry and utilities as well as building owners. So 
starting with the NECB, we can walk through what those tiers are. So as a whole, NECB 2020 is approximately equivalent to NEC, NECB 2017, although there are changes in several, several areas. These include um, uh, introduction of, of procedures or the refining of procedures for voluntary air tightness testing, um, the updating of equipment performance tables for both hot water heating and HVAC, improved thermal characteristics for the building envelope, and of course, the tiers themselves. There's four tiers. Tier one requirements are roughly equal to those of the of NECB 2017, while tiers two to four, the energy performance levels are meant to be reachable using many of the same building practices, equipment, and the technology already in use today. Tier four targets generally meet or exceed ASHRAE targets for net zero energy ready. Also in, in the NECB 2020, we now have four, a total of four compliance paths, prescriptive, prescriptive trade-off, performance, and the tiered performance path. On the national building code side, we have five tiers. Tier one, again, is generally equal to section 936 of, of the national building code 2015. Well, tiers two to five uh, follow roughly, again, voluntary standards such as Energy Star, R2000, and the CHPA Net Zero Energy Ready label. In addition to the performance path, there is also a, a prescriptive path, which is based on four tiers. Now, compliance with the prescriptive path is based on accumulating energy conservation points. So at tier one, the base code, uh, no points are offered. Uh, to achieve tier two compliance, 10 points are required. And tier three and four uh, of the national model codes are not yet completed. And uh, the intent is to com complete those in the next code cycle. Now, how this, how this works in, in practice, we can, we can look at Ontario again for an early example. As Ontario has ad 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 proposed adopting tier three, uh, that means to reach compliance with that tier, they've allotted 30 points. They've provided 30 points for, uh, for, for compliance to be achieved. Compliance can be achieved through things like improved air tightness, higher performing HRVs, high, high efficiency service water heater, service, service water heater uh, as well as smaller house size. Now for both the NECB and the NBC, neither the base nor the tier performance levels are expected to change in future code cycles. So the performance levels that we have set will, will remain static. This means, this is important because it means that instead of more regulation, tiered codes are clear regulation. They help set the direction for industry. They set a long-term goal of net zero energy ready buildings. And through that, they encourage the development of new processes and practices to meet that goal. So in terms of one, one of the drivers of, of uh, code adoption in this, in this cycle is a desire on the part of provinces and territories to harmonize their building codes with, with the national model codes. All provinces, provinces and territories have now committed to a harmonization agreement. And as part of that agreement, um, they'll implement the 2020 codes within 24 months of publication. So 24 months of this past March. And whereas future code cycles will be, will be reduced to um, 18 months of their, their publication. So in terms of um, harmonization, tiered codes play another important role. Um, through tiers, a province, a territory, or a municipality can adopt a tier that meets their unique needs as well as the capacity of their local market. So by this, I mean the workforce readiness and the availability of, of resources such as um, uh, products and, and uh, uh, such as um, insulation and, and uh, in, um, better performing windows. All this, all this happens while moving toward the, a, a shared national end goal being the net zero energy ready standard. In terms of support for, for net zero energy, Ready with building codes. Um, so we found that Canadians overwhelmingly support net zero energy ready building codes. Um, in polling conducted by Abacus Data in the fall of 2021, we found that um, there was strong public support for provincial go governments that require all new buildings to be highly energy efficient. Nationally, we found that 70% of Canadians either support or strongly support making every new building net zero energy ready. And the support is steady across all four political parties. We can agree on something. Public, public support is consistent across urban and rural residents, as well as different income, income brackets as, and owners and renters. So what does this all mean? This means that this is our moment. 
Soon we'll have in place trade codes in, in each province and territories. This means that we'll have a clear regulatory path that leads our building sector to net zero energy by 2030. And so what comes next? Well, advocates in each province and territory can call on their, their local governments to adopt the full suite of tiers. As mentioned, the tiers are a roadmap for where we're going and they're crucial to helping everyone in the building sector plan ahead. This is part of the reason why adopting all tiers is, is such a, a key activity. There's also adoption of the upper tiers. So adoption of codes takes time. Usually, as mentioned, uh, two years, moving to a year and a half at, at, uh, in the future. This means that to reach our net zero energy rating standards by 2030, we need to adopt ambitious levels of performance in the code in this, in this current code adoption cycle. And we need to do so to avoid uh, a large rush or costly increase in building performance closer to the end of the decade. We need to be ambitious today and lay the groundwork for success tomorrow. Provinces can also consider addendums. So provinces uh, and territories can amend the code to suit their needs. And a good start in doing so would be to introduce zero carbon heating and hot water systems in all new buildings. And we're already seeing this take place at a municipal level in, in um, leading municipalities such as Vancouver and Montreal. And of course, they can also uh, reintroduce mandatory air tightness testing, which, which was um, enjoyed uh, broad public support during the public review of the 2020 model codes. Um, but uh, uh, we found ourselves without mandatory uh, air tightness testing in the final version of the codes. And we can also build early support for code compliance. We all know that building, building code is only as effective as compliance enforcement. And uh, Efficiency Canada's research has highlighted, highlighted this and, and uh, recommends a net zero building code acceleration to support activities generally that reduce the financial impact of code compliance, address costs and technical concerns, and de-risk adoption for, for everybody, for provinces, industry, and uh, eventual building owners. So at the end, we have less than a decade to meet our goals. We need provinces and ter territories to take bold actions now. And those bold actions now will set our building sector on a path to net zero energy ready buildings in 2030. Um, so that's the conclusion of my presentation. So I want to say thank you first off, but also that uh, I see a number of questions have come up and look forward to answering any of those questions here or in the breakout rooms later. Back to you, Kirsten. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kevin. Next, I'm going to be talking about why we need to adopt and talking a bit about the adoption process and how we can advocate around that. Uh, if you are still with us and you're still listening, I'd love to hear in the chat two words about how your day is going so far. I can tell you mine is uh, busy, but exciting. That would be my two words. So would love to hear from you in the chat while I get my presentation set up here. There we go. So I was going for bold. How can we win? So in talking about Building code advocacy. Do, do, do. I'm going to have four topics today. So why do we need to advocate? How can we do it? What are the provincial plans we'd suggest? And then launch us into our breakout rooms. So why is it that we actually need to advocate? What are some of the challenges that we'll see embedded in the adoption process? So Kevin has talked about the fact that all provinces have agreed to harmonizing their building codes. Despite this agreement, results are not guaranteed. Tier one of the new model codes represents little to no increase in energy efficiency over our last model codes. So if every province adopts but adopts tier one, we're not moving forward. Provinces need to aim to adopt the highest possible tier that they can right now with a commitment to move forward to net zero by 2030 or sooner, sooner would be awesome. Municipalities should be allowed to move ahead if you've got um, you know, really progressive, ambitious municipalities. We wanna ensure that they have the power to you know, keep moving forward, raise the standards. And as Kevin mentioned, there are also weaknesses that can be addressed through amendments. And so this is not a guaranteed outcome. We do need to do the work to ensure that provinces are uh, you know, pursuing the best possible path forwards. So how can we actually make this change? Again, really simplifying it for a shorter presentation, there's three steps to stronger codes. The first is we need to build a network and that's part of what we're doing today. So we wanna connect, spread the word, hosting events like this. Uh, myself or Kevin is happy to come and speak to other organizations about this to, and host other webinars and workshops. And we need to educate climate supporters about the importance of our built environment. I think all of us know um, there's lots of folks who are really passionate about climate change and have never even 
had a passing thought about building codes. So let's make sure that they understand the importance of it to meeting our net zero goals. We also need to move forward on building consensus around this. So not just talking within our bubbles, but widening the tent, we really need to engage with builders, help them, you know, we can work together to identify roadblocks and offer real solutions to those roadblocks and branch out to new audiences, groups that might not always be in our circles, but could come together around this issue. Um, thinking of groups like unions and heritage building advocates. And then we need to take all of that, you know, the network building and the consensus building and use it to apply pressure. So we can go to the media, we can look at our pity pack members for each province, which is the folks who actually um, represent each province in the development of the codes. We can do social media campaigns, sign on letters, and really municipalities can play a key advocacy role in some regions and um, encouraging the province to adopt uh, a higher tier of the code. So I wanna go into some myth busting here. So I'm gonna launch a poll. There will be no judgment if you get the questions wrong. Really what I wanna see is just um, where the audience is at right now, what we already think about the code. So you'll see the questions on your screen now and be able to answer those. What I'm gonna use this to do is to um, showcase how there is sometimes misinformation that is spread about the codes um, and about how they uh, will impact you know, each province and territory across Canada. So I'm gonna leave this open for a minute or two. I know the questions are a bit wordy, so uh, <laughs> my apologies for that one, but uh, I'll just give you a second here. Just for the sake of keeping the presentation moving, just gonna close it there and share the results. So we can see there's a lot of disagreement about some of these answers. Of course, I'm referencing a specific study, so hard to have that number on hand. Lots of different answers about what tier one actually is equivalent to. And then some pretty good consensus around number three. So let's see what the actual answers are here. So what is the cost increase for building a single family detached home? It's about 6%. And when you look at that, um, you know, over the cost of a mortgage and especially paired with the cost savings that you'll get from those, that decreased energy usage, pretty minimal cost differences overall. Tier one you'll see is about equivalent to the uh, NBC 2015. So like we said, no big energy efficiency increases uh, if you're just adopting tier one. And for the question of whether or not, you know, improving our workforce skills can decrease those costs, pretty good consensus there. It is true that if you can learn principles of integrated design, if you can ensure that folks have the skills to build to net zero and really achieve that performance, you'll see those costs come down over time as people get more familiar with these building techniques. So there's some common arguments you're gonna hear about, you know, um, our net zero energy, energy ready codes. Uh, the first, and I'd say the most common, common is that housing costs will increase significantly. And I'd say that, you know, we've just seen that study, it's only a 6% increase, and you'll see different numbers from different studies, but it's all, you know, fairly low, especially in comparison to something like the increase in cost of land, for example, is going to be a, a big factor in a lot of markets about housing costs as compared to the pursuit of a higher energy efficiency. And of course, this is part of that expanding the tent and talking to folks who are, you know, working on the housing crisis, they need to be allies in this conversation and we can be sure to um, address those concerns and make sure that there's supports in place to make sure that we don't significantly increase housing costs. You also hear sometimes that the workforce isn't ready for net zero and in some provinces, I would say this is absolutely true in some different markets within provinces you'll have um, less of that workforce capacity, but the role of the province isn't to throw the hands up and say okay well we can't do it. We need to develop strategies so we can start training the workforce of the future, the federal government is going to be providing some supports for that the province can also develop a strategy, but we need to apply pressure on them to do so. And sometimes you'll just hear that it's not the role of building codes to enforce energy efficiency requirements, but I think a lot of us on this call would agree, if we want to meet our climate targets, we need to ensure that we are raising that bar. We can't just use carrots, but there's also sticks. There's also the role of regulation to lift the floor for energy efficiency. And as advocates, you have a secret weapon, the Codes for Climate Toolkit. It is chocked full of information to respond to common arguments, to talk about advocacy, how we can work together on these problems, I will put this link into the chat for you, but it's a great resource to go and find everything we're talking about today and then some. So putting this into the chat here, 
I also do see there's lots of uh, conversation in the chat. If I'm missing anything, I will get back to you uh, after this presentation. So now provincial plans, this is where we dive in a little bit away from that federal scope into each province. So we're really lucky to have a very smart, um, you know, very uh, well-connected team of volunteers that works with us on the Action on Building Codes Council. And we've been doing a lot of brainstorming over the last few months, information gathering to figure out where is each province at and what's something, you know, a lever we can push, a gear that we can turn to start making change and moving each province forward. So we're going to suggest tactics that, you know, we think would be a good step one, not the whole plan, but step one to start moving things forward. And this is going to form the basis for conversations in the breakout rooms. So in Alberta, we actually don't have an action on building codes council members. So step one is going to be to find that person who wants to lead the charge and uh, start working with them on some of that strategy work. British Columbia has committed to not adopting down. So they're not going to be adopting the model code in a way that weakens their existing standards. So what we'd recommend actually there is that municipalities start working on uh, adopting the a carbon-based code, which we just had some information from the um, BC Step Code Council about a consultation opening up soon around that. So that's our, our recommendation there. Manitoba is lucky to have a really great organization already leading the way. So our recommendation is you get involved with Sustainable Building Manitoba. They are great. They are the place to go. In New Brunswick, the code was really recently changed. And so what we think needs to happen there is more of a market building, conversation building around energy efficiency. And the way that we can do that is by advocating for PACE financing. We can start to talk to the province about the importance of energy efficiency. And if it's passed, we could really open up the market for energy efficiency there. In Newfoundland and Labrador, you're seeing municipalities really leading the way. And they have a lot of jurisdiction, uh, sorry, a lot of power when it comes to codes and, and compliance and enforcement. So we want to be working with leading municipalities to understand their stance on adoption and explore any areas for joint advocacy. Getting into Nova Scotia, really strong energy efficiency community there. So what we want to focus on is an educational campaign about the exact implications of each tier of the code, the costs and benefits, and really instilling that sense of urgency and also uh, talking about workforce development and the enforcement process. Ontario, like Kevin said, has committed to adopting tier three, not the right move. <laughs> so what we wanna do is put together a stakeholder council to bring together all the various voices in Ontario to then go to the province with a plan forward towards net zero uh, to really encourage them to take advantage of the benefits of the tiers. Prince Edward Island is really lucky to have some great uh, provincial ambition. And so the main thing we're looking for there is advocacy around increased federal resources to support that ambition, as well as opportunities for knowledge sharing, because there's provinces and, you know, even municipalities that have some great tools already. Let's share those so that nobody has to start from scratch. In Quebec, again, really recent adoption and changes to the codes. The main focus there is we want to build a culture of enthusiasm and compliance around the code by talking to builders and architects. Finally, Saskatchewan, what we really need there is to start that network building and finding more advocates in the province. So what we wanna do is host a networking event to start convening everybody so that from there we can work together on our advocacy work. So that's a lot of me and Kevin talking. Up next, you get to talk. So we're gonna go into our breakout rooms for the next approximately 20 minutes. The questions we wanna ask are, is this tactic the right thing? Um, is it going to help us on our path to code adoption? What does success look like if we move forward with it? Who should be involved, individuals and organizations? And we have some ideas on the left there about our rules of brainstorming. So knowing that we're right at the start of this process, we want to really throw everything at the wall. So encourage wild ideas, one conversation at a time. You have a chance to be visual. I'll show you the jam board in a second. And we do want to go for quantity. There's no bad ideas. So you're going to go into a breakout room for your province, uh, and from there, um, you'll be matched with a moderator who's someone on the Action on Building Codes Council. They are going to be able to, just going to open this up here so I can show you the Jamboard really quick. They're going to guide you through a discussion on, um, on these ideas and on how we can work together to advance advocacy in your province. So to give you a sense of how this works, you'll find your province's page. All the questions are there. If you're not feeling very chatty, then you can use the sticky notes to add your ideas and to keep track of things that are discussed. If you see something you like, you can add a thumbs up to it. 
And if this is something you want to be involved in going forward, you can put your information there on the bottom of the screen.